Could Jurassic Park become a reality? I think that's the first thing that comes to, to individuals' minds when they hear the word dinosaur DNA. They may hear a report of scientists discovering uh, the remains of DNA in, a, in, a, in a, some fragment of a bone somewhere, and immediately their mind jumps to, oh, we're going to get the sequence, and we're going to create dinosaurs and have this Jurassic Park. Um, I'm afraid to, uh, to break the bad news to you, but that's a, a long way off and probably impossible. I want to talk briefly about um, the differences between finding sequenceable DNA and how long can that be preserved. Sequenceable DNA would just be DNA that could be sequenced, that there would be enough DNA, double-stranded DNA material, to read actual code from that, and that would be the only hope of actually obtaining the genetic code of an organism from the past. Uh, and that would only be the very first step of trying to recreate that particular organism. But sequenceable DNA is a, is a high and lofty goal because it requires um, DNA to be preserved in near pristine condition, that the A's, the T's, the C's, and G's that make up DNA uh, would still be connected to each other and wouldn't be extensively modified such that we could go in and extract the information from it. Now that's a far cry from what is actually being uh, suggested when you hear reports of the remains of, of organic molecules being found in dinosaurs. Uh, sometimes you hear about uh, soft tissue preservation and we imagine like whole cells and pieces of tissue as if they were you know, just laid down yesterday and you could munch on them and you could taste them. Um, but soft tissue preservation still in includes a lot of mineralization in which the um, biomolecules have been um, modified to a great extent and often combined with other uh, metal ions like aluminum and iron and, uh, and also uh, may incorporate various forms of silica and so forth, uh, becoming something very different than they originally were. And so the question really is, how far back uh, can we detect the remains of DNA? And the remains of DNA, in this case, is the breakdown products of DNA molecules. Now, they may retain some of their um, characteristics uh, in terms of, uh, of some of the parts of DNA strands and the molecules of DNA. But finding the remains of decayed or modified or greatly modified molecules that were, used to be DNA is very different than saying that you've found uh, DNA, which is uh, sequenceable DNA in which we can discover the code. Uh, let's see what we're, uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm bringing this up is because of a very recent um, article here from September 24th in 2021 in SciOrg, uh, popular um, report of a scientific article, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. And here's their headline, Organic Molecule Remnants Found in Nuclei of Ancient Dinosaur Cells. Now, this is not a bad headline. It actually reflects, it reflects fairly well the, the findings uh, of this particular study. Organic molecules, so that means they're carbon-based molecules, have carbon bonds, uh, along with hydrogen and oxygen, typically. Uh, and they're remnants of organic molecules. You know, we're not saying that these are complete organic molecules like you would find in, you know, in, in uh, an, an active living organism. They're found in the nuclei, all right? Well, the nucleus is a part of the cell, and for the nuclei to be identified in an ancient um, uh, preserved organism, you have to have some way to preserve internal cellular structure. Uh, this doesn't mean you're, that the, the whole cell is preserved as it is, and we're looking at it as it was. Uh, it's still highly modified, so the membranes have been uh, maybe replaced or modified such that we can see where the membrane is or was, but it's not actually the same membrane that existed in the nucleus in the past, but we can see where the nucleus was. So we can properly say that I can see the nuclei of these cells, um, kind of like um, uh, fossilized uh, tree wood, um, petrified wood. Uh, you can see internal cellular structures uh, at times because of the incredible preservation or replacement of the original components. Now, when I say replacement, it doesn't mean every single atom has been replaced, um, but the original biomolecules uh, have been rearranged, uh, reorganized, I guess you could say, or 
we would say modified, but um, maybe combined with other molecules from the environment to produce a whole new set of type of molecules forming a matrix um, that retains some of the appearance of the original cell, but actually isn't, um, you know, a completely, an, it's not completely the same as uh, that original cell in its, in its um, uh, make organic molecule makeup. So these are ancient dinosaur cells that have been observed. Uh, and let's take a closer look at those when we look at the paper itself. Sorry, here we go. So the paper's from Nature Communications. Uh, it's a nuclear preservation in the cartilage of J-hole dinosaur codipteryx. I guess that's how we say that. And what did they find? All right, they found um, that dinosaur cartilage, which has been found in several other dinosaurs. Cartilage is a very tough uh, tissue. Uh, and nonetheless, it's a, it's, it's a tissue, but it has also been um, very much modified by the fossilization process, but we can still see internal uh, cellular organization in some of that. Um, it's, as it said here, the cartilage fragment is highly diagenically altered, all right, diagenically altered. That just means that uh, the in environmental chemicals uh, from the environment seeping through this bone have become incorporated into that tissue. Um, but but cross sections uh, show exquisite preservation, you know, after demineralization. So embedded within this uh, within these minerals that then are forming, uh, there are still remnants of the organic molecules themselves that still have chemical bonds. I said those chemical bonds may not be all in the same arrangements, but nonetheless, there's still remnants of chemi uh, of chemicals of organic molecules that are still present there. Now, here's here's the thing that's important. The, they used a histochemical stain, hematoxylin, that stains nuclei. So this is something you would, do, you would use on tissue today in order to see the nuclei more clearly in, in when, you cross, when you do a, a thin section of, of tissue. They applied that to this demineralized cartilage of cotaipteryx, and they actually applied it also to chicken, and the two specimens reacted identically. And one dinosaur chondrocyte, or a chondrocyte is a cell from cartilage, uh, revealed a nucleus with fossilized threads of chromatin. All right, chromatin is the is what your inside of your nucleus, your DNA is found in the form of chromatin, and that is your DNA is wound around proteins called histones, uh, and the two combined make up what's called chromatin. It's a way of organizing your DNA, um, and so they found um, fossilized threads of chromatin. Now it's it, it really important to remember they didn't they're not actually saying they have found chromatin like we could extract this chromatin and you would have the histone proteins and there would be your DNA and it would look just like uh, a, an organism's DNA and histones today no they're saying these are the fossilized threads of chromatin so we're seeing where the chromatin was and some of the molecules, some of the molecules that were there, the, the DNA and potentially the, the proteins of histone, some of those molecules are still there in that position, but they've probably combined with other molecules uh, to form a resistant, um, uh, something that has been able to endure, you know, a long period of time. So they've become very stable in, as they've reached different uh, molecular conformations. And that con those mole new molecular conformations have allowed them to endure, potentially, I, I think it's something like uh, 95 million years, right? An incredible amount of time. So it's in, in the paper, they, they talk a little bit more about this staining. They applied it both to the demineralized cartilage. The two specimens reacted identically. Oh, actually, I read this from the abstract already. Um, and they talk about this is the second example of fossilized chromatin that's been found. So this isn't a brand new uh, example. We're finding, you know, with with more precise techniques, better stains, we are able to identify more and more biomolecules uh, from fossils. And for some, that's surprising, right? They think that uh, in the past, they think that um, that this this wasn't possible. Like everything should just be stone. Uh, you know, and no organic uh, remains left. But we're finding that there are, you know, a lot of fossils that have quite a bit of organic content left. And again, I, it, 
organic content doesn't mean exactly the same organic molecules as in the present. Um, they have experienced a long period of time in which they can recombine with other molecules to degrade. So molecules will degrade, but if they don't degrade completely, so in some conditions they may degrade very slowly, and during that slow degradation process, if there are other molecules around that can bind to them and form new chemical bonds, it might stabilize them, which then might preserve some aspects of their organic mole molecular nature, um, enabling those molecules to survive then for long, long, long periods of time. Um, you know, we know, we know of, I mean, oil is a, a, a biomolecule that survives for an extremely long period of time, but that but crude oil is not something that you find in an organism in that particular form. Uh, that is the breakdown product or the decay product of organic molecules that have been rearranged, those organic molecules have been rearranged to form um, what we would call oil, and it reaches a fairly stable state uh, where the, the backbone structure of just carbons and hydrogens is is very stable over long periods of time and can last for long periods of time. So the question here though is what about DNA, right? Can DNA reach some kind of stable state at which some aspect of the DNA molecule, some remnant of the DNA, DNA molecule can still survive over long periods of time under the right conditions? And it would appear that some bits of nucleic acids can survive for, for long periods of time. I've talked about both of these things quite extensively in the past, and so for a lot more detail, I made a video, Creationism and Ancient DNA, and that's really about the history of how scientists have discovered more and more and more about how DNA uh, both decays and may be preserved for long periods of time. Um, so we've we've come to a greater realization of what can be done and what can't be done. And I've also talked about the, I guess, the conundrum that, say, young Earth creationists or those who believe the world is very young have um, with this whole topic of ancient DNA and DNA preservation. So if you want to learn more, you can look at those articles. But let me just point out that there's some uh, more fairly recent papers that talk about and are trying to investigate this whole idea of how does DNA actually get preserved? What is the decay mechanism? Uh, until probably 15 years ago, there was a lot of assumptions, but not a lot of tests on those assumptions. And biochemists, um, paleogeneticists, and so forth have become more and more involved in in um, understanding the chemical processes. And I can tell you from reading the recent literature, we've realized it's far more complex than we ever thought. And more people are finding more ways that organic molecules can be preserved in some state uh, over time. So here's one paper, a new model for ancient DNA decay based on paleogenomic meta-analysis in which they're um, going to compare a whole bunch of different um, uh, ancient um, resources and compare the types of preservation under different conditions uh, and they come to the conclusion that um, that there is you know in terms of finding preserved DNA molecules like double-stranded DNA molecules with uh, with A, T, C's and G's as nucleotides uh, a code uh, contained in it um, those we do think that DNA does break down, uh, you know, within a million years, there shouldn't be a whole lot of long DNA strands left. And by long, I mean just even 15, 20, 50 base pairs. Um, however, under particular conditions, it's thought that maybe DNA of five base pairs and more might be able to survive for 10 million, tens of millions of years. Uh, and as I'm gonna suggest, um, little tinier bits of DNA the remains of modified nucleotides uh, can probably last for uh, hundreds of millions of years once they reach a particular age. However, uh, little bits of DNA does, doesn't do anyone good. Uh, we're not going to find out the code of organisms from the past. So a 65 million year old dinosaur with DNA that's DNA that nucleic, I'll say I call them nucleic acids that are preserved, doesn't necessarily, and I would bet that they're not going to contain um, lengthy pieces of DNA in which we'll be able to interpret uh, the code, the original code that was there. Now, I might be wrong because there might be ways to look at it with microscopes and be able to look at modified 
pieces of organic molecules that are next to each other and infer whether they were A's, T's, C's, or G's. Um, but we're not going to find pristine molecules uh, of that. You know, if we were, we would have already collected them because scientists would have, you know, when they dissolve these, um, demineralize these tissues, and then they're claiming to be able to stain DNA, uh, you should you should wonder why haven't they just then done a DNA extraction and then sequenced little bits of it and told us what the sequence of dinosaurs are. Well, because staining DNA is different than staining a portion of DNA that has enough similarity to modern DNA that we'd actually be able to sequence it at all and get any kind of code out of it. That's the critical difference. Um, so here's a, another article, um, and this is from 2021. Very informative article, uh, over, kind of going over all the different kinds of stains, all the different kinds of methods to get DNA out of ancient organisms, and then discussing just how far we can go right now and then what the potential future might be. Um, so maybe moving beyond the quaternary. Uh, it's pretty clear that we can get DNA if it's preserved fairly well under the right conditions over the past several hundred thousand years and up to about a million years. But they're suggesting we might be able to push that out to maybe three to five million years uh, potentially. Um, but that's kind of, I think, it, for these authors, they think that might be the upper limit for finding, and again, I'm going to call it sequenceable DNA. DNA of long enough fragments in which the organic molecules that remain are close enough you know, to an A, a C, a T, and a G that we can figure out what they are um, such that we might actually be able to put together the pieces of a few organisms uh, from the last couple million years. And here my, here my stress, it's, it's, it's really important to understand this, that, um, that DNA molecules that are found in these older organisms are not the same biomolecules that they are today. They're highly modified and changed. Um, they've either swapped and rearranged parts, um, and so they're not connected in the right spots, which makes it very hard for us to investigate them, uh, or they've been combined with other molecules, um, so making a giant mess. Now, when it comes to uh, that that particular report and the chromatin and you might ask well so what do they mean when they see uh, doesn't chromatin a long strand of dna aren't they seeing a long strand of dna no they're seeing the remains of where a long strand of dna was and in that particular position where that chromatin strand was there are bits of biomolecules that are the remains of nucleic acids um, the hematoxylin i don't have the, i don't have a picture here um, but the, the hematoxylin molecule, it does need to have, it needs to connect to um, two bases, actually just the backbone of DNA. So you have DNA has that sugar phosphate backbone. And on that sugar phosphate backbone, it has two oxygens that can attach to the backbone if there are two sugars next to each other. Actually, I guess it's the two phosphates um, in, in a row. So it needs two phosphates in a row in order to make that connection and that would then be the thing that is staining that particular biomolecule. But that doesn't mean that, that particular, those two phosphates are connected to the rest of a nucleotide, which is the adenine, cytosine, guanine, or thymine. Uh, it could just be a little tiny, little, tiny two-piece um, polymer, right? One sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate connection uh, that remains, and there might be a whole bunch of those little bits. Um, those are far more stable than the whole our, uh, nucleic acid molecule itself. And so, you know, their uh, staining shouldn't be interpreted. I mean, it may be, you know, maybe with more investigation, we'll find out there is more DNA there than, than, than we think. But it could just be the little tiny bits of remains of the decayed molecules of nucleic acids. Um, you know, I hope that there's actually, you know, actually serviceable little tiny bits of strands that we might actually be able to get little pieces of, of, of DNA sequence from someday with some future technology. Um, but it's, I, I guess, I guess the whole point of this is I know some people will see this particular article and they'll say, look, all right, look at that DNA was found in dinosaurs. 
Uh, and they're going to imagine a double helix. And why can't we just go in and pull that see, pull that um, that organic molecule of DNA helix out and just sequence that DNA? And then we'll have code from dinosaurs. And we can do all kinds of nifty things with it. And I'm not talking about making dinosaurs. I just mean like actually looking at the code of dinosaurs and seeing how they compare to say, hey, mate, for example, maybe birds or something like how similar are they uh, to birds or how similar were they to uh, one another? Um, I'm doubtful that we'll get that information, but I never say never, and I don't think it's impossible. I don't understand why. I don't understand why scientists, or in this in this particular case, you know, my interest in creationism, creationists say, "Oh, that's that's impossible." Scientists have been saying this is impossible, and therefore, if any DNA is found, that's obviously proof that the world is young. I say, uh, not really. Actually, if the world were young and only and in, in all these dinosaurs were preserved just 4,000 years ago, I would expect to find DNA of lengthy pieces that we could just, I mean, I could have my undergrads extract inside my lab and we would sequence it up and we would sequence a dinosaur. I mean, if it were easy to do, if that kind of you know, DNA was actually remaining, um, we'd have sequences of it because lots of people would have, have tried to do that and have not been successful. Uh, and so I think if, if young earth creationists are right in their interpretation of world history and dinosaurs lived just 4,350 years ago, um, surely many of them would have been preserved in ways that would have uh, preserved uh, millions of base pairs of DNA that we could readily sequence. Um, the fact that it's very difficult to find uh, any evidence of staining uh, of tiny little bits of potential remains of decayed pieces of DNA <laughs> you know, um, in a few samples that are in special tissues that are, uh, that are especially adept to preservation under particular conditions, right? You know, it's, it's, it's very rare situations where we find, um, you know, cellular material and these organic remains that haven't been completely obliterated uh, by the processes of time. So, there you go. Uh, can DNA be um, uh, found in dinosaurs? Yes, I think that there are actual remnants of atoms from nucleic acids that are still inside the bones of dinosaurs, and we can stain and see them there. But that's a completely different thing than saying that the original molecules in the con you know the original molecules in the conformations that they were in before how all the atoms were connected to each other uh, in nucleic acids still remain and there could be a polymer of those which is a long long chain of individual nucleic acids that's what would be necessary to get sequence those seem highly unlikely to have remained because we know of a number of different chemical processes that um, break DNA, uh, depolymerize it, um, and depurinate it's called, so or depurination, and that's actually changing some of the nucleotides uh, into other forms of nucleotides. So even if we were able to see some of those molecules left, we might get fooled and not even get the right code from them. So it seems rather hopeless, but I'm not completely hopeless. I mean, I, I, I will always hold out hope that under just the right conditions, there might be a sample where we'll have some serviceable, small, very small fragments of DNA that get sequenced from dinosaurs. I have a lot more hope that we'll be able to sequence small bits of proteins and infer amino acid structure from some of the preserved proteins in dinosaur bones, like cartilage. And and be able to figure out strips of sequence of, of amino acids, which is a, actually a secondary way of inferring the DNA code of dinosaurs. And we'll be able to ch compare those cartilage sequences with cartilage sequences from birds and other organisms and get some idea of what dinosaurs, um, you know, how, how, how related they are to uh, organisms that are alive today. All right, that's my spiel on dinosaur DNA. Um, I look forward to the, the, you know, what we'll surely find in the future. And um, like I said, nothing's really going to surprise me. I'm always excited by whatever happens. Um, and so I'm hopeful, but I'll say realistic uh, at this time about uh, our chances of ever having a, a complete dinosaur DNA genome. All right. Um, I'll talk to you later. If you enjoy this content, please subscribe to my YouTube station. Bye-bye.